my name is Heath Mixon, and I'm the director of UAB's Art Play. Art Play is the education and community and campus engagement initiative for the Alice Stevens Center, Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts, and we also work hand in hand with um, UAB's Institute for Arts and Medicine. We are so happy that you're with us today virtually for our first in a series of fall um, into winter lunch and learns. This one I'm super excited about. But to tell you a little bit of some of our programs we have going on right now, uh, the Alice Stevens Center has wonderful drive-in performances. Ava just launched the most incredible exhibition called A la carte, which we are happy that this is kind of a, uh, a part of, and so we're happy about that. And Art Play has just started their fall classes. We are also working with schools with our Meet the Artist series. Our Student Arts Council is in full effect. So we are doing all the same things we've always done education-wise, but they just look a little differently in their own line. Um, our upcoming Lunch and Learns that we're super excited about, one is the Medicinal <clears throat> Benefits of Spices with Dr. Luis Pineda. That's in November. And then we're doing another one that's not food-related for December called Film for the Holidays, which is a dialogue on film critique, and they're using holiday films for the backdrop of that. So that should be super fun. A little housekeeping. If you have any tech problems, you can message Dana Faro. She is on here. Um, and if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat. And Rachel Arnson on the uh, Art Play staff will be happy to help you with those. Now, it is my just immense pleasure to introduce my friend, Allison Long-Lowry. Allison is in the arts community and is an artist herself in, in the role that she plays at Meredith Food Studio. So we are so happy to have you here, Allison. And I'm going to turn it over to you for our first Lunch and Learn, the uh, art of the test kitchen. Hello there. Thank you so much, Heath. It is our honor, really, to be a part of this. Um, we are really dedicated to our community at the Meredith Food Studios, so to be able to bring this together with Art Play and Al Stevens Center is really special. So thank you for having us. I wish we were all together. To be honest, I would be like a lot happier if I was on a stage with a microphone, because I like that. But I'm going to pretend like I am hosting a panel of three brilliant women who work with me in the Meredith Food Studios. So. We're going to hear from them in just a in just a few minutes. Katie Barrera is our test kitchen director. We have Anna Theoctisto, who is one of our recipe developers, and Marianne Williams, who's another one of our brilliant recipe developers. So, and we're going to talk about what does that even mean, recipe development, in a minute. That's where the art comes in, um, and some science. Um, but I wanted to give you a quick intro of what is the Meredith Food Studios. Maybe you've never even heard of it. Some of you that are from Birmingham might remember Southern Progress Corporation. Maybe you remember that. I've worked here a long time, so that's what we used to be called. We are part, we used to be part of Time Inc., so that is Southern Living Magazine. It was Cooking Light Magazine. It was Oxmoor House Books. I'm sure if you've been in Birmingham a while, you know people who've worked in at the company. So we've the only constant in publishing is change. So we've had a lot of change through through certainly my career and through um, the last 20 years for sure. And so we used to be, ba we, we're still based in, we're still here. Some people don't know we're here, but we've changed a lot. So a couple of years ago, actually in 2015, the company decided we needed to consolidate our, our offices. And so we, Sanford bought our property, which is amazing. They're a great partner. And so we were going to be moving into a building that had no more test kitchen, that had no test kitchens and no food, photo studios. Well, the lifeblood of some of our magazines is beautiful photography, well-tested recipes that, pe that people can count on. So we had the chance to update our space into a 40,000 square foot gorgeous studio. So when that happened, we opened in January 2016. Not only did we consolidate Southern Living, Cooking Light, Oxmoor House into one big studio, but we they actually, the company brought down all the food content for all of Time Inc. magazine. So that might mean People Magazine has food in it, Real Simple, Food and Wine, 
health, all of that food content was brought, up, brought down to Birmingham. Not many people know that, right? Because we're kind of, we're really set up like an agency that does this work for so many different brands. But really, we got that work because of the expertise in food here in Birmingham. Katie was with me when we opened. Um, that was seems like a long time ago, but we did it. And Katie helped us recruit great talent to help round out our team. And Marion and Anna were, were brought in after that opening and are just doing beautiful work. So fast forward two more years, more change. Meredith Corporation bought Time Inc. So that is Better Homes and Gardens, another big magazine company. So now we are one big new happy family. So we're now we're called the Meredith Food Studios. And what we do is we develop recipes, test recipes, which we're going to talk about in a, a lot today, and we've then photograph them and do video. So it is all food based. So anything food based for all the Meredith titles are done mostly here. We test around 5,000 recipes a year and photograph them. So it is a lot of beautiful work across so many different brands. We have 18 different brands that we work on. So we don't just work on Southern Living. We work on food and wine and parents and shape and all these great brands we get to work on in this really stunning space. So today we're going to talk about the test kitchen part of what we do. We also have a photo studio. So once we get the, the, the recipe where we want it, it goes over to photography and we do that, that beautiful work of photography. We're going to talk a little bit about food styling as well today. <clears throat> but she's, yeah, she's going to show some shots of our space. So again, if some of you may have come, we've done a few benefits um, here for Children's Hospital. You can just kind of scan through, but we have four test kitchen, little test kitchens in seven different bays. So we have 28 test kitchens in the space. And we're right down here on Lakeshore. Who knew? Um, this looks very clean. It doesn't always look that, that is very put together. Um, but that's our beloved taste testing table, which uh, Katie will talk about that some. We, we miss that table, guys, because we are testing recipes at home right now. We're still shooting. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But that is where the magic happens. That's where we taste recipes all day, every day. Right, Katie? Like, that's what we do. So it's a lot of, a lot of tasting. Um, it's a beautiful space. It's very um, minimalistic because we need to be able to alter the look based on what brand we're working for. So real simple, Southern living, totally different aesthetic. So our space is very um, simple in that way. There's some people working in a kitchen. Can't get that close anymore. That looks very dated. Um, right now we'd have our mask on and we would not be that close. But all that to say, we test in home kitchens. So they are replicas of a high-end kitchen because we are testing recipes for home cooks. We need them to work for someone at home. So that's really important to us. You can just pull through if you want to. Huh. Can y'all hear me? Something happened. Okay, so there's our prop house. So we have this amazing prop closet. It's, I think 15,000 square feet. So it's really not small at all and it's not a closet. Um, so this is where we pull all of our tables and linens for all the shoots that we do. It's very fun, I must say. And we have a full functioning video studio. So, I mean, we're going to talk about some of this in a few minutes about how digital the digital landscape has changed our jobs so tremendously. So we can shoot, we shoot a lot of video. I think we shot, um, we shot 10,000 videos last year. So it's a lot, it's a lot of videos. So just, I think that's it. So this is, we're going to talk about this, but this is some of our working through COVID shots. So now we're, we are shooting here some, well, no, we shoot food photography every day, of course, totally masked up and distance. And then Anna and Marianne and Katie at home with the test kitchen work. So those are some shots of us with our mask on. So you guys feel free to, ask questions as we go, because they're going to kind of stop me as, as we go. Um, but I'm going to start with my team introducing, um, introducing ourselves. So I'd love to go around. Marianne, you're first, I think. I see your pretty face. So <laughs> tell us 
your background. How does one get a job in a test kitchen? What did you study? Where are you from? Tell us, tell us about yourself. So I'm from here in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I went to college at Auburn University, graduated with a psychology degree, and then didn't really know what to do. So um, went to culinary school at the International Culinary Center in New York, and I did the Italian program. So I studied in uh, Italy after New York. Um, it's safe to say that to get a job in the test kitchens, just say that you like grocery shopping and you're going to get in. <laughs> so, yeah. You tell, Marian, what, what is grocery shopping? Why is it so important? So shopping for the test kitchens, I started out doing that. And um, you're shopping for all of the tester developers. So thinking about if they're doing six recipes a day, you're shopping for all of those. Um, it's and a there's lot. like 12 to 14 people doing that. So it's a large group of people. So it's a lot of groceries um, for sure. So, mm -hmm. so Anna, you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Anna. Um, I'm from Gainesville, Florida, and I went to the University of Florida for my undergrad, and I graduated in um, agricultural education and communication. Um, and after I graduated, I realized I could either continue to get my master's or I could go to culinary school. Um, I chose culinary school, obviously. I went to CIA in Hyde Park, New York, and you're required to do a six-month externship when you're there. And I always knew I wanted to go into the journalism side of the culinary world. Um, so I went after food magazine internships, and I landed one with Bon Appetit in New York. And I ended up working there for about seven months. Um, I did an extra month there for free. And um, afterwards, after I graduated, um, they weren't hiring, but um, I ended up getting a job at Hoffman Media, which is also here in Birmingham. Um, they do a lot of Southern uh, lifestyle magazines for women. Um, and I worked there for about four and a half years. I did recipe development and food styling in their test kitchen for about two. And then the other two... Um, I worked as a food editor for two of their brands and then I got a job at Time Inc and I went over there and I've been there since it's been about two years, I think at least yeah. we pay our interns by the way. So <laughs> that's important. I think there was a lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> there was. Yeah, there, there was. was. <laughs> How about you, Katie? Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us today. It's exciting to see so many people here to talk about this. Um, and I love hearing Anna and Marianne's stories again, even though I know them. I think everybody who works in test kitchens comes at it from a very different way because I don't think many people grow up saying like, I want to be a test cook. Like that's not really a thing. Um, I uh, also, I went to Bucknell University and graduated um, with a degree in English. And, you know, what do you do with a BA in English? Um, I always was a writer and loved writing. And that was kind of the vocational path and then food was a vocation. I loved it. I was passionate about it. And somewhere along the line, uh, you know, a teacher told me to write what I really loved and that was food. Um, and so I actually started journalism school, um, realized that I could get more out of learning to be an expert in what I wanted to write about uh, and went to culinary school at the Institute of Culinary Education in New York. And like Anna, I also did a, an internship. I did mine at Food and Wine. Um, that's how I broke into publishing. And um, I, I did a stint at America's Test Kitchen. And that was really the first time I realized that the journalism side and the cooking side could come together in one space. Um, and that was what really sold me on test kitchen work. Um, my, my first real job in the industry was in the test kitchen at Rachel Ray magazine. Um, I was there for, for a while. I ended up being the food editor there and then came to Birmingham about six years ago to be the test kitchen director at Cooking Light. 
And we were about a year away from hubbing into the Meredith Food Studios uh, at that point. And so that was a really exciting transition to be a part of. Um, oh, I don't think I said I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I spent most of my most of my grown up life in, in New York. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. And I mean, no one cares about me. I've been at the company a long time. I have a lot of degrees that don't make any sense like the master's in English and art and Italian. And like Haiti, I didn't know you could do food and journal. No one told me that. I did not get that memo. And thank God I got an internship here. And I really was fascinated with food. I'd spent a lot of time in Italy and I was able to combine those things. So I've been a food editor. I am not a test kitchen chef like these ladies. I am not a food stylist right now. I try to keep this train going some days. Um, but I am, I'm on the editorial side. That's my background. Um, I ran the digital for cookinglight.com for a lot of years because I was really interested in the path to digital and then came back to this uh, test kitchen and photo studio and working with the artists that work at the food studios is the best part of my job. Like I cannot do what they do, but I'm fascinated by it. Um, and it's that, that's the thing. Like when you can figure out different things that you love and bring them together, that's, that's, I guess that's the key, right? Um, hey, I have a question in the chat from Terrence. Yeah. Uh, so, so much of creating recipes is understanding how ingredients work. What resources can you share to help the home cook? It's a great question. So resources, Katie, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I think Anna probably has some, some good ones too. I mean, we, I think cookbooks are still a really great place to go um, for that kind of thing. And the the combination of ingredients working together and like the science of that that you're talking about is really particularly important with baking. I think um, a lot of us, I'm more on the savory side because I like to play with food and be able to just kind of know the general rules and then throw some stuff in a pan and see what happens. Um, bakers are much more scientific and they really do have to know the alchemy of how things go together. Um, I mean, we have a lot of resources that, that we look to. Um, Harold McGee is a great um, source. He wrote a book called On Food and Cooking that really gets into the science of how ingredients work. Um, I think King Arthur Flower actually does a very good job of talking about um, about baking and ingredients and, and that kind of thing. And they actually have a hotline that you can call when you have questions while you're cooking, which is super helpful. And I have done while developing recipes. Um, Anna, do you have any other like kind of authoritative sources that you go to? Um, the Flavor Bible. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's not really a cookbook. It has like a bunch of, um, it has like every flavor, every kind of ingredient, and then how you can combine the flavors. So things you wouldn't even think about that could go together. Um, that book is like a really, like it's a, it's a staple standard on a lot of our bookshelves. Mm -hmm. Mary, so gonna, in, go ahead. Yeah. Marianne, do you have anything to add to that? Some resources. I was actually going to agree with Anna about that flavor Bible. I've used that many times just to look up, like you can look up time and see that it pairs well with, you know, a certain kind of nut or vanilla or something like that. It's really interesting. It's a good one. We have another, start, sorry, we have another question in the chat real quick. Um, do you guys offer workshops for photography students on food styling and setting up photo shoots? We do not. We've been asked a lot about that. We, um, we, 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 are, we do not offer that currently. Um, there's an organization called IACP, the International Association of Culinary Professionals. And I know that they were, before COVID, the plan was to bring their annual conference actually hopefully here, and then we would have some sessions available. So it's certainly something we've explored, but because we are professional, we are creating content for our uh, business partners. We, we don't currently do that, so, but it's a good idea. So let's talk a little bit about recipe development and how you, how, what is your process for recipe development? And Dana, if you want to show, I've, I've put together some pictures so you can guys can kind of see these are these are test kitchen shots, Mary, and don't worry, they don't have to be gorgeous, right? But that this is some of the behind the scenes of what 
some of our testing process looks like. So I have, we're not going to go one by one, but um, we can start with Marianne. She can kind of start talking about what her process is for recipe development. And then after you can tell the snapshots are over, you're going to see what it looked like in the actual magazine when we shot it um, here. So those are those glorious pretzels from the, is that the, it's the October issue of Food and Wine. So Marianne, do you want to start with a little bit about your process for um, recipe development? Sure. So for me, um, unfortunate, not unfortunately, but I start with Instagram and blogs and websites that I visit often. Um, my feed is normally just full of images that I can really find inspiration visually and go from there. So um, I'll click on a recipe that looks delicious, um, read through the ingredient list and kind of think about how I can put my own spin on it. And then I'll start Googling other recipes that are similar. And um, that's just how I start. But um, we do have brands that require um, nutritional parameters. So like health, eating well, and real simple, they'll ask us to keep it within a certain amount of calories, sodium, sap, fat, etc. cetera. Um, and we have a program on our computers that allows us to input each ingredient which is super helpful and um, tells us how, you know, we come out um, per serving. Um, and then we have certain brands will say, they'll give us the name of the recipe and just say, develop this and we're free to go from there. But others will say, we want five dinners for March. And you just, yeah, it can be difficult so, kind of a direction, but it's, it can be really creative and fun. So like with the pretzels, you helped refine, you tested that recipe to kind of make sure it worked, right? It was somebody else's recipe. That was somebody else's recipe that I tested twice. Um, it was a difficult recipe, kind of. I'm not, I don't pride myself on baking or dough or anything. So um, it was, it was fun. <laughs> but basically tested the recipe twice and then Weeks later, I was asked to be the hands for that shoot, too. So, yeah. So you kind of took took a recipe and perfected it, right? Correct. Okay. So I think, so Anna, I think we saw some glorious looking squash. I think that was a squash story from, um, was that health? Uh, yes, I think it was. Do you want to talk a little bit about, kind of, also kind of maybe explain to them how we get the work requests from our brand partners that ask us to do to do the recipe development? Sure. So the first thing that happens is the editors in their in their brand world um, come up with ideas for each issue of their magazine. And then um, when the time comes for us to act on the story that they have, um, they send us a pitch request um, and it usually has like all the parameters. So it'll be like, we want five um, squash recipes. We want to use butternut, acorn, spaghetti, and I don't know, delicata or something. Um, and then sometimes they'll say, this needs to be 10 ingredients. Sometimes they'll say, we want this to be done in under 30 minutes. Um, Depending on the story, there's different parameters. But anyway, we get the pitch request. From there, we pitch. We usually over pitch. So if they want five ideas, we'll pitch eight to ten ideas. And then that goes back to their editors, and then they pick from our pitch. And usually they'll have some comments in there about, like, maybe more specific ideas within the pitch. And then we go from there. So once that's in and approved we hit the ground running um and we start developing and for me the same with marianne i i start with visual i look at the pictures that's where i get my inspiration from and once i find like the right look um then i'll i'll work with the ingredients um and as far as like baking recipes i often um either look at cookbooks or um, well-known, like established baking blogs or websites like King Arthur Flower. 
and I look at recipes that are similar. I also look at our own websites because a lot of times we've done very similar recipes that can be either tweaked to make it new um, or it just gives me a better idea of um, the flour to fat ratios for different types of cakes or cookies. Um, and that's it. Great. And then after we, after we do it, we usually taste it. We go, usually we go to the tasting table, but now we can't. Now we taste it ourselves. Um, sometimes we have our family taste it with us and get their feedback. Um, and then we send, right now during COVID, we're sending all of that, all of our tasting information um, to our portfolio managers who then send it on to the brand. That's great. And, you know, she mentioned, I mean, chicken, y'all don't know how much chicken we've done. We do a lot of chicken weeknight meals, right? Like we get a, a, all of our magazines run so, some sort of quick and easy column. And so we've got to make sure we have new ideas for chicken, new ideas for ground beef for Southern living. Like that's part of that in getting an inspiration and riffing on it. Um, for sure. Katie, you have anything to add on that? Yeah, part? sure. Um, you know, I think, um, there, there are some really fun and creative parts of the process and, you know, getting to think, okay, you know, what are the 16 interesting ways I'm going to use squash, um, is the most kind of fun and, and joyful, um, thing that we do, but it's not just a free for all. So working on 18 different brands, every brand has a different audience, every brand has a different mission. And so we need to put on the hat of whoever that brand is, right? Like a, a, a squash story for food and wine is going to look very different than a squash story for real simple, um, because their readers are looking for for different things. So we have to be very aware of that we have to be really schooled in in the recipes that are running in that issue and that have run recently because we don't want to run something that's overlapping or that they've just done. Uh, seasonality is incredibly important. So we we wouldn't want to call for figs in a recipe that we knew was gonna, where it was going to run in January. So we have to be very cognizant of that. And we're working about six months behind when... Um, when the story, when a print story is going to run. So it can be super challenging um, to find and shoot and develop with, with these ingredients. Um, also the feel, the feel of the recipes has to feel seasonal, right? You don't want a, a stew in the middle of summer that's on your stove for three hours. So there's a lot of parameters. Um, and I think you know, these guys start with visuals because ultimately um, most people look at magazines first and want beautiful pictures. And so when you're developing a recipe, uh, well, when you're developing a story, you don't want to just think about each individual recipe, you want to think about how the whole story is going to look together on a page. So you don't want a bunch of big brown circular things you have to, you know, if you're doing a story about meringue, you better have some cute little individual pavlovas and a big cake and a um, something with cocoa powder in it to, to make it look chocolatey and a different color palette. So you, you really have to think of these recipes in a very micro level, right? Like you're in that kitchen and you need it. That's the science. I mean, this is like writing a lab report. You need the time, you need the temp, you need a visual indicator, you need to get and capture all of that information. So you make sure a recipe works and you need some poetic language in there to describe things. And that's where it can also be artistic on a very specific recipe level. I was reading a cookbook the other day and um, the the recipe writer said to nudge the, uh, nudge the eggplant and you didn't want to move it because then it would fall apart. But you, but you needed to get it unstuck from the bottom of the pan. And I just thought like, yeah, nudge the eggplant. So there's a lot of, a lot of language um, that goes into what we do. Um, and then you're thinking about the big creative story and you're thinking about the brand. So there are so many layers that you have to consider um, when you're pitching a story. It's never just, we want a squash recipe. I have some questions in the chat real fast yeah. for you all. So from Heath, has COVID changed ingredients that are readily available for testing? Yes. I mean, 
COVID has changed everything, but Katie, don't you agree that the availability, especially at first, was very difficult? At first, it was really, really challenging. We also wanted to really limit the amount that people were going into grocery stores. Um, So we were doing a lot of delivery. But yes, meats were at a premium. Flour, people were hoarding flour um, and dropping it off at other people's houses if they had any in their pantry. Marianne and and Anna, what were some other ingredients that we were really struggling with there? Chicken, for sure. I feel like that was a big one. For the flour, I had to go pick up flour and Roebuck for those pretzels, actually. Um, yeah. Paper towels too. That was a big one. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeast. You couldn't to make any kind of bread or leavened thing. There was yeah, that. And, all, and yeah. all of our digital brands wanted sourdough, everything like immediately. So that's, that's the other thing to think about is we're also doing work for digital brands that need things a lot quicker, that have a quicker turnaround that are more seasonal. So yeah, it's, it's been a challenge. It's evened out for sure. Um, yeah. And delivery is not consistent. We usually, we might have to source something that we can't get here. We can't get it like we normally could overnight or even props, some of the stuff that we need for photo shoots. It's it's definitely a challenge. Any other questions? Yeah, we have one more from Toby. Are you working on recipes with current seasonal foods now for 2021 publications? We sure are. Absolutely. So in the summer we did, this summer we did the ones for next summer. So, and then we're heading into fall, which we will do. So we really encourage our brand partners to think that far ahead. That does require planning, right? So sometimes that's hard. Um, But you can't, we many times get asked to develop or photograph recipes that simply we can't get the produce so that whenever we can do it ahead in the season, that's the best. We don't like to fake it. So speaking of faking it, we were going to talk about food styling because I think that's another piece of what we do. And I think some people don't even know food styling is the the person who is cooking, preparing the recipe for a photograph or a video. So that is the testing part of it has already happened. So Anna has worked as a food stylist and Marianne has been assisting on food styling sets for sure. So Anna's going to tell us a little bit about what, what food styling is and what we do and don't do in the Meredith Food Studios is around around food styling. Um, so food styling for us is basically the last cross test, the last time the recipe is going to be made before it hits print. So it's really important to our food stylists and, and for the studio to make the recipe as written. And oftentimes the food stylists make a larger quantity. So they'll make it two to four times the recipe because they're going to need, um, they're going to need more of it because the food is going to sit on set. They might have a practice shot. And then once that practice shot gets approved, they might actually put the real food on, which means they'll make it again, or they'll use more of the food that they have. Um, and a lot of times for food styling, um, we they might they might not finish the food the same way as in the recipe. So if it's um, like a grilled zucchini or something, um, we're probably not going to go outside to the gas grill. We'll, we're probably going to use a grill pan. <laughs> and actually, um, cast iron grill pans get a lot better char marks for some reason than a gas grill. So we use those a lot for uh, grilled meat stories, uh, for grilled vegetable stories. It just, it does a better sear. Um, And then as far as meat goes, um, oftentimes we don't cook meat all the way through for photo um, because we want it to look juicier, which sounds terrifying um but most people are not eating the food that is made for food styling (laughs) sometimes we are but a lot of times we're not like especially meat because it's going to be sitting on the plate waiting for approval for a long time um i know we've got a question about food waste because i'm sure we do because that is a big that is it's something on our hearts and minds a lot as well because there is we don't want food waste, right? But like what you're saying, Anna, some stuff you cannot eat because it's been on set too long. Um, right. some, some things just don't last. Like bacteria will grow and you don't want to eat. Right. But anything else, and before COVID, we always 
share all of our food. And so surprisingly, I mean, people take stuff home for dinner. We, we do pantry giveaways. We do have a local um, partner where we were giving our surplus groceries. Um, but we also have just a giveaway in our building for anybody who, you know, it's a, it's a great thing, especially for interns and pe- people that come up and get some groceries to take home. But it definitely is something, especially with COVID, it's a little bit harder because we are not encouraging sharing food right now um, in this environment. So mm-hmm. any other questions, Rachel, while we're, we're good on the questions? Okay. We're good. All right. Um, I want to touch on quickly something that's really important to us. I think the topic of cultural appropriation and really thinking about um, inclusion and diversity initiatives is something that all industries hopefully are really addressing. Our company as a whole is making this a really top priority. Um, It is very relevant for us because we are asked to create content on behalf of many cultures and groups that we may or may not have expertise in. So Katie has done a great job of leading the effort for our company really to think about recipe development. And it's, it's not something maybe you even thought of that this is something that we really have to think about in our industry. But Katie, you want to share a little bit about what we're doing um, to try to tackle this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there, I could talk about this all day. It's so, it gets so nuanced and so deep. And I'm sure that's true in every industry. But, you know, just to give you a sense of some of the, of some of the things that, that have been brought to light and that we're thinking about, you know, there is this kind of question now um, for all of us as recipe developers, like, who is allowed to develop certain kind of cuisines and certain kind of recipes? Like, can I not develop a recipe for Jamaican jerk chicken because I'm not Jamaican? And I think there's a conversation happening about that right now. And some, some people feel strongly that the way to go is to only solicit uh, recipe development from, you know, people who have that culture um, either in their background or, or a certain expertise in it. Others I've, I've spoken to a number of, you know, BIPOC chefs who really feel sad and limited by that, both themselves and um, just the, the joy and the fun of food being a melting pot and that bringing, you know, different traditions together and what is authentic, right? Your grandmother's cornbread is just as authentic as her grandmother's cornbread and they're probably different. So it gets very anthropological and deep very quickly. But I think, you know, we want the bottom line is that we want to bring in more diverse voices um, to our staff and to our pages. And we also want to look really closely at recipe language um, because I think a lot of choices are made in order to make recipes and food approachable for the the reader. And it ends up kind of whitewashing um, things or, or inserting bias that we don't mean to insert. And I'll just, I can give you a couple of examples that you might see in a magazine that we're looking at. Like, recipes often get named after continents. So like an Asian beef stew, we want to move away from that, either giving a specific regional attribution or, or naming specific ingredients in the dish so that you get the idea of a flavor profile. Um, I think the way we sell recipes and head notes can also be problematic. So you might see a dish that's called exotic and, oh yeah, it's exo- exotic to who, <laughs> right? Um, but, but, or putting unconscious value judgments on foods. Like we're, we're often making um, some kind of regional cuisine lighter or healthier or easier. And that implies better. Um, so really, you know, looking out for those kinds of things, food trends are super tricky. We want to amplify and promote food from other cultures, but we shouldn't just act like we discovered ramen. Um, so, so these are the kinds of things that, that we're, that we're tackling. Um, and I've created a few committees within our test kitchen to look at, um, very closely at our, our recipe development processes to make sure that we are aware and, um, and have steps in place where we can raise issues like this with our brands. Um, we're looking at, 
at our industry in general. I don't know, um, you know, for people who are, are close in with the, the food industry, there's been a lot of shakeup at Condé Nast and, and Bon App, at Southern Foodways, um, at the LA Times. So really our industry is being um, kind of called out for this right now in an appropriate way. And, and we want to make sure that, that we're looking at that. So our committees meet once a week. They're small groups and they're all, you know, just first having the conversation, making it part of our jobs to talk about this and just raise awareness as as we go about our work and our day. Um, and then to come up with some actionable items. So we're trying to spend more of our grocery money at BIPOC owned businesses, really practical stuff like that. Um, and then also coming up with some best practices for for recipe writing and development. So we feel really confident um, that our that our content is free free of bias. So I, I'm sure everybody um, is is doing similar things in in their own world, but I think because we have the platform that we have and can influence um, culture and food being such a strong part of culture, that this is really really important work. Yes, and it will take a long time. We all know that, but it's just a you know wanted you guys to kind of get a sense of where we are from our our end of the world. I hope every industry is looking at that closely and. Some of that, the digital piece of that is really interesting because the, you know, a lot of what these guys do is an art. There's such an art to flavor combinations and the writing of the recipe, all of that stuff. But we also have a lot of science, right? The measurements, the, the how much time did it take, all that kind of stuff. But also we have digital. So, of course, our print magazines are, you know, a lot of times where we're focusing some of our photography efforts on, but our more people see our recipes online than they do in print. So Meredith reaches 175 million consumers a year. So that is across print and digital. So one out of every two households in the country touches one of our brands. And so we know that getting to them online is really where most people, I mean, most of you guys, when you lead a recipe, even if you look at magazines, thank you, you're probably searching for it, right? So we have a lot of efforts around SEO. So SEO is just search engine optimization. And when you're you're typing for, you're searching for your next uh, cornbread casserole that you're going to have for Thanksgiving, part of the part of the science is we want to have a recipe on that front page of that Google search result. And so a lot of times what we're doing is we have digital brands, scientific, you know, genius digital people telling us the terms that people are searching for. And we want to make sure we have the best possible product available for that search result. And so some of what we do is, is, around, is around that kind of work. And then, of course, all the recipes that are in the magazines end up online as well. And um, the visuals there are so, so important. So just wanted to kind of touch on that. So let me ask the ladies, what's one of the most frequently asked questions you get about your job in the test kitchen? Anna, you want to? You want to take that? Okay. Well, the number one question that we all get is how do you not weigh 5,000 pounds? How do you not eat all of the food that you're cooking or your coworkers are cooking? Um, there is a freshman 15, I think. That there happens. is. But there is also, <laughs> yeah, there is also a thing that happens when you are, people who cook know what this is like, right? Like if, if I, so now that I'm a test kitchen director, it's a lot harder for me not to eat the food because I'm just sitting around waiting for the food and getting excited by the food and smelling the food, right? And then I'm like, oh, thank you. But when you're cooking and you're immersed in the food and it's there and around you all the time, you're much less susceptible. You're kind of like over it by the time it gets to the table. So there's definitely that part of it. It's also a very physical job. Very, You're on your feet all day, you're walking around, you're moving. So um, it is a very physical job, but everybody wants to know how we don't weigh 5,000 pounds. You get sick of it. You, you get sick. You it as you're, as you're cooking it and you just, by the end, you're just like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's you, Marianne. Anything else? Well, like I said earlier, how do you get a job there? Grocery shopping mm -hmm. is a good answer. <laughs> also, most people just say, you know, what a cool job, what a dream job. And it really is. Like, we're really lucky to work there. I didn't make her say that, by the way. But <laughs> it is. We do get a lot of questions about how you get in to this, you know. And there's a lot of different entry points. We've definitely hired people from the restaurant 
world, we're really lucky to have great, of course, great restaurants here. And so we've also lost some people to the restaurant, not lost. Some people have started restaurants. We've had at least three people start restaurants who used to work here. So we really value that kind of relationship we have with the restaurant scene in Birmingham. And so some people go to culinary school, journalism, internships straight into us. Some people go to culinary school or restaurant come to us. It, it's really all over the board. And for food styling, in my opinion, food styling is a craft that you really have to apprentice under a great food stylist. We right. have brilliant food stylists who work here and have had assistants train under them. And that is really the entry point for food styling. It is definitely like photography, a craft that you have to really, um, you have to, to just really apprentice under somebody who's, who's doing it. And food photography is also a unique, special skill set, And we have some of the best here um, on staff here at the food studios. So. So we're in the last 10 minutes. Is there anything? How do you, you translate? Oh, keep getting that so how do you translate your day job into how you prepare meals for your friends and family I get this question a lot Anna you want to you want to chime in um I mean I think I'm kind of like everyone else <laughs> I struggle with dinner time and I think now that I'm home all the time it's food prep has become kind of important to me and so has batch cooking so I've been making a lot of meatballs and freezing them. It works. It works for me. <laughs> it, I mean, it makes dinner really easy. I just throw them in the oven and they're done. Um, also, when I make like a lasagna or something, I make two and I freeze one. You just put it in the fridge and you thaw it whenever you want to eat it. And then you cook it. It's great. I don't know. Uh, sometimes we get recipes that I think my family will eat. I have a three-year-old who's picky and a husband who's incredibly picky. So sometimes the recipes I get, I know they'll eat. Sometimes they're not going to eat it. So, so it's just like the rest of us, right, Anna? That's what you're yeah, saying. Just like the rest of you, I struggle. <laughs> How about Especially you, being around food all the time. It's like I know. Um, I think that I kind of simplify when I cook at home now. Um, also, working from the studios, I wasn't as familiar with like sheet pan meals before and now I'm gravitating towards you know I just want to use one pan that kind of thing definitely that is something we try to focus on when we're doing recipes is minimizing the mess minimizing steps like those are the kinds of things you guys think a lot about which is important what's you Katie you're cooking for yeah. a little one I am well but she uh, she eats what the grown-ups eat she's got to do it um I like to take little little elements out of bigger recipes that we do and kind of sprinkle them into onto everything. So one thing I've been really into lately, um, Mexico has a, a, a family of salsas that are lesser known that are nut and seed based mm -hmm. salsas and like salsa matcha. And, and basically you are taking like nuts and, and sunflower seeds and sesame seeds and shallow frying them with some garlic and oregano and chilies. And it's so super delicious. And, and it's one of those things that you can have like a little batch of and like you put it on avocado, you put it on your eggs, you put it on your salad. So like, I'm really into like finding that one batch thing that's really unique in a recipe and just having some of it in the fridge and geeking out on it for a couple of weeks. And I've also started really like if I want really good crunchy nuts for salads for anything, shallow frying is like totally the way to go. It's not like crazy deep frying, you know, it's just enough oil to cover them and really slowly and they get super nutty and more evenly toasted. And so that's the way to go for toasting nuts and seeds from now on. So I just like to take like little learning moments, like, aha, yes, that's brilliant and kind of change the regular things that I always cook. Cause I don't want to think of something new to cook when I come home. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> exactly. I know that's the biggest I'm the same way. I, I'm a planner. I definitely plan our meals. I have older kids who have a lot of activities. So I always try to do one new thing, not every week, but at least once every two weeks, I try to introduce something new because the picky, I've got the picky and I'm trying to help help with that. So we're, we all kind of have the same struggles, I think at dinner time. 
So we are five minutes out. Yeah. So we do have some questions in the chat for y'all. If we can go ahead and get those. Awesome. So from Kathy, is there a list of the magazines slash companies that work with you? Yes, I have. Yes. Do you want me to list them all? Um, Y'all help me. Food and wine, health, Southern living, real simple, parents. Parents Latina. Who am I missing? How did I say? In style, eating well, people. eating well, all, all, res- all recipes, my recipes. Rachel Ray. Rachel Ray. Ray. We did stuff for Magnolia Journal, yeah. um, Reveal, which is a new magazine we have, and Sweet July is another new magazine that we're doing. Um, we do some for Entertainment Weekly. We do. The recipes they have in there, we do. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I won't make you strain your brains anymore. <laughs> I should have the list. I know. I'm <laughs> okay. And then from Carly, what are the top five staples you should have in your kitchen? Oh. Who wants to take that? Okay. I'll, I'll say some tools. Tools or staples? Did she say stools or something? Go for it. I mean, is, is it a tool staple or, or an ingredient staple? Or an ingredient staple. I think they mean ingredients, but I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, tools that you should have. I really like microplanes. I use them a lot, not just mm-hmm. for citrus. I use them for ginger, garlic. garlic. It. I, I don't really mince garlic anymore. I just grate it. I um, also really like those little teeny tiny offset spatulas um i use them not just for baking um but i use it for savory stuff too sometimes it's really helpful to have like something tiny to like slide under something in your pan or to loosen something um i also really like my juicer it's like one of those squeezy juicers Mm, that's important about pantry i mean i'm going chicken thighs garbanzo beans um or some kind of dried bean that's what yeah, I've been living off of. Bean. Some onions and some olive oil and some Parmesan cheese. It's dinner, baby. <laughs> I think vinegar is a super important ingredient, too. Definitely. And pasta, some noodles. Find yourself a good spice blend. Those are also, also good. Like, we use smoked paprika a lot in the test kitchen, I feel like. Yeah. Add some smoky flavor. It's really good. Trader Joe's has something called onion salt. I use it on everything. It's amazing. (laughs) I'm like taking notes over here to up my (laughs) cooking game. Uh, We have another question uh, from Shelby. Back to food styling. Do you have any tips for building a prop closet? What are some good staples to have in your prop closet as it pertains to the photography of simple, healthy meals? We shoot all of our test kitchen photos on white. Like I think having, you know, just a really good set of open shallow bowls and white plates with not much, the rim of a plate is kind of, if a thick rim is not great, like you want just a flat surface of plate Um, and, and white is, is the best and most consistent. Um, that's what I would say about, about plates and bowls. Natural light is so important too when photoing. Yeah. And I feel like neutral linens are like a huge thing, but some people, I, just plain, like plain versus patterns. Yeah. Um, and for utensils, if you get stuff that's a little bit um, kind of, it's older or it's a matte finish, shiny things are hard to photograph so because of the light bouncing off it so it's better to have kind of a matte finish on on food um prop styling stuff thank you guys um we have another question from monica when using herbs are fresh better than the dry or does it depend fresh is almost always better um but you need to use a lot more of it 
um, dried herbs if they're fresh. So dried herbs also need to be fresh. I mean, they have about a, a shelf life of a year. So everybody go back through your pantry and throw out 90% of what you have in there from dried herbs. My pantry too, no, no doubt. Um, dried spices are great, you know, chili powders, mustard powder, right? But dried herbs like parsley, oregano. Um, so f watery herbs, cilantro, parsley, um, chives, like anything more delicate like that is really better fresh. Thyme, oregano, rosemary, things that are a little woodier, you can get away with using dried spices. They, they hold better as dried spices. But, you know, if you have the option for fresh, fresh is better. Well, that's the end of the questions and that's the end of our time. Do you all have anything else you would like to say or end on? Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for having us. We're so thrilled. We had so many people join and yeah, thank you for having us.